Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. This is uh, Dr. Rospaini Tasmin. I'm lecturing for the uh, service management course. And today, this morning, I would like to cover on the first chapter, which is the service economy. For this uh, first chapter, basically, uh, the material I have uploaded into the uh, Edmodo platform in which uh, you could uh, let, uh, you could retrieve and see the material is about the same that the one that I'm presenting right now. So, the service economy. So, here is uh, the introduction page. What are the link objectives that I'm supposed to make you understand in this course? Uh, I think uh, the lecture will be uh, divided into uh, two sections which is a part 1 and part 2. So I may lecture for around 20 or 25 minutes and later uh, I take a break and uh, soon I will follow with the part 2, another 20 or 25 uh, lecture uh, portion. So just uh, uh, bear with me that this lecture has uh, two, uh, I would say, two parts. Okay, learning objective of this uh, course, basically I need to make you understand about the central role of services in an economy. How does it contribute to uh, national economy and also global economy? Identify and differentiate a few stages of economic activity and also describe the features uh, of those uh, economic development from pre-industrial to the uh, post-industrial to the uh, fourth industrial revolution right now. And uh, I'm also explaining on the B2C, which is uh, economy of service based on uh, business to co uh, consumer and also uh, later with a B2B, business to business uh, service uh, environment, explain the essential features and so on. So these are part of the learning objective that I'm, uh, exp I'll am i be explaining in this uh, lecture. And uh, as I men uh, mentioned earlier, in that model here is, uh, is your access code. Okay. <clears throat> Bottom line is, uh, to start with, uh, what is the definition of service? What, what, what do you think about service? How it is being defined? Well, according to uh, the author Valerie and Zithelm and Mary Jo Bittner, service are basically deeds, process, and performance. And according to this, uh, the main textbook author, Professor Fitzsimmons, so he said that a service is a time perishable, intangible uh, experience in which you can own it, uh, perform for a customer acting uh, in the role of co-producer. So you uh, deal with a uh, second actor, which is customer, in order to make the service complete. However, uh, to consolidate the definition, I come up with my own definition. So by my definition, service is basically a combination of a delivered intangible and or intangible customer experience, whether you can own it, touch it, or it is a combination in exchange for what you pay uh, on top of your time and also your effort. So these are the uh, some of the definitions uh, available uh, that we'll cover in this service management course. So what are the definition for service firms? How the service firms differ from manufacturing firms? So basically, uh, service firms like uh, Postlaju, uh, Shopee for your online uh, purchase, uh, Leo Burnett, uh, advertising company, like uh, and also Plus, uh, Project Laborai Utara Selasan, uh, those are basically service firms. So they are providing service in which that service you cannot uh, really take it back or you cannot own it, but you are merely involved in the service as a co-producer. So in order for service uh, firm to provide service, the service enterprises uh, uh, are basically organization that facilitate the production and distribution of goods, support other firms in meeting their goals and add value to personal life. So by Professor Fitzsimmons' uh, definition of service firm, it is uh, basically involving organization uh, to facilitate production and of course, di distribute goods and to support other supplier or customer firms to meet their goal. For example, to deliver best service and add value, add good experience to 
the uh, customer as a users. So if we take a look uh, in the global scale of uh, the importance of service in uh, contribution to employment or in terms of uh, job uh, for people around the world, so you can see that like country in the, uh, for example, United States, you can see that uh, it is, uh, as far as the service is concerned, 78 uh, people or 78 employment or jobs in U.S. are basically 78% are services, All right? So if you take a look at another advanced country like Germany, so they claim or they reported that 69% uh, of the employment are basically related to services. So you see that advanced countries are moving uh, towards the industrial chain as far as uh, job uh, is concerned that they are focusing more on uh, higher value of job in the form of service. Well, if you take a look at the uh, developing country like uh, China, so uh, China is still developing and you can see that they are still focusing mostly in production, uh, manufacturing of goods uh, on top of their existing uh, services. Uh, so they reported that it is reported that 35% of employment are basically related to services. Well, you now understand uh, how is uh, the difference between the advanced country and also developing country like China and Malaysia. So we are pretty much uh, focusing still more on production on top of in comparison to advanced country like America, uh, Germany and Europe. So they have been very much focusing on services as far as employment of their people. So <clears throat> if you take a look on the trends of US employment by sector, right? so these are the graph uh, by sector means uh, this green color is a service, uh, this yellow is a manufacturing, and this uh, blue is agriculture. So back in a few uh, decades ago, so up to year new millennium, you can see that in the olden days, uh, US uh, employment are basically uh, concentrating on highly on agriculture. And you can see as we are moving forward to the new millennium now, year 2000 plus, so basically ag agriculture is uh, decreasing in terms of uh, employment number is concerned. However, if you see on the service, uh, in those olden days, in the uh, 80s, uh, 60s, 70s, so you see that the service level is still low, around 20 to 30%, but nowadays it goes as far as 80% uh, level, as far as the new millennium. On top of that, if you see the manufacturing, which is the green, uh, sorry, the yellow line here, you can see the, manuf the manufacturing is still going upward, even though at, uh, early in the 1960s and 70s, manufacturing in the employment for uh, manufacturing in USA is also decreasing or basically going down. So here is the scenario in which the more advanced country uh, it is going to be, the more employment will be focusing on services because that is where the higher value is being created. Okay, perhaps uh, you recognize this uh, picture, this guy. So who is this uh, gentleman? Okay, as I stated here, uh, next uh, to him is, uh, he is the CEO, founder of Amazon, which is Mr. George, Jeff Bezos. Amazon basically is a service company, so they deliver good ordered by many people around the world. And Jeff Bezos now worth around 175 billion, and yet he is a service provider guy. So he is not a manufacturing guy. So even though Amazon deliver so many goods around the world, but it has no uh, book publishing factory, it has no shoes factory, but important thing, he delivered the service to customer and he captured the order of customers of many, of many people, right? So these are the significance of uh, service because, you know, the richest man in the world is also uh, service uh, oriented uh, business.
Okay, that is uh, Jeff Bezos. So if you, he is not alone. If you take a look uh, on other rich uh, people uh, in the world, all right. So he is uh, founder of Microsoft, uh, uh, Bill Gates, uh, Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, investment uh, leader in the world, uh, Warren Buffet. Uh, this company, Berkshire Hathaway, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. Do they basically produce uh, physical goods? What do you think? Do they manufacture physical goods like uh, automobile, books, uh, aeroplane? So the answer is no. They are all service-oriented uh, founder company in which Microsoft is considered software. Software is basically uh, non-tangible because you cannot hold, touch it. That is a software. And Amazon is uh, basically a servicing company. Facebook it is a value, cre uh, value creation company. Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway is investment company. All right. So they are these are all uh, top of three or four rich people. They are all service based uh, individual. So they are focusing their business on services in, instead of manufacturing products or goods. So in order to be rich, you have to consider the richness uh, or wealth of uh, this world belongs to the service uh, to the service sector instead of the physical good. Okay, in Malaysia, like in the palm oil industry, you know that who, who, who is the uh, richest uh, person in the chain of uh, palm oil production? Is it the palm oil farmer? Or is it the uh, middleman who bought the uh, palm, uh, oil, uh, palm oil fruits uh, to the factory here? So uh, along the chain, so I think uh, the richest uh, uh, beneficiary of service is basically the middleman. So the middleman purchase uh, the uh, goods uh, from farmer with a low price and later they sell to the factory with high price. So this service uh, provider is basically making the most with a low cost of investment because they buy it low and they sell it high to factory so the service sector is making the most uh, money so that is why i'm claiming that if you want to be rich focus on service because you don't have to you don't have to bother with the uh, nitty gritty uh, of uh, producing goods you just merely buy and then uh, buy at low price and then sell high uh, to the your buyer so on the overall picture of uh, supply chain for service, here is the description of diagram for role of services in an economy. How does uh, how does service uh, function in order to contribute to the economic cycle? So the most important part is this central part, which is the distribution of uh, services, which is here. So in service, basically one uh, to the most major import, uh, the most important uh, role of services basically in infrastructure service, for example, highways, uh, roads like plus, and also distribution of service, for example, wholesaling, retailing like Amazon. So these are the two important roles, uh, key roles of services generated by infrastructure and the distribution. Okay. So you could name it in like a DHL, a logistic company, because it deals with distribution. Amazon also deal with distribution because uh, they take your order and then they acquire the goods uh, from other supplier and later they sell it to you. So these are the two prime uh, service uh, role. On top of that, this infrastructure also uh, basically related to financial services because in order to build highway, you need some uh, uh, budget uh, or I would say investment in terms of uh, financial investment so you get it from the bank and uh, for the financial service they also provide their service to manufacturing uh, services inside the company uh, inside the company for example in manufacturing you have a uh, finance uh, accounting legal R&D design for example like uh, Peridua manufacturing and it's also related to business services provided to the manufacturing like Peroda, for example, advertising. 
right? So on top of that, distribution services also related to uh, government uh, function uh, of services, for example, education. So these are providing, uh, I would say, graduates or people who are qualified to take up the job and also related to personal services and also consumer, right? So basically, services uh, is uh, not something which is uh, like a secondary or set aside. Okay? It is not a peripheral, but it is actually uh, a parts and components uh, of a integral uh, combination to make the society uh, works as far as the economic uh, cycle is concerned. Okay, in the textbook, it is uh, discussed uh, on the stages of economic activity. So basically, this is coined by uh, Mr. Clark and Fisher. So they hypothesize that economic uh, activity uh, basically starts from the pri uh, this primary layer, bottom uh, bottom layer here, which is basically agricultural, uh, mining, forestry, and so on. And then it move up the chain uh, to become the secondary layer, which is goods production. For example, from fishing, uh, they turn into manufacturing, like into uh, becoming uh, sardines, uh, can, uh, processing, packaging, and so on. So the next stage, it uh, will move on on the academic activity to domestic services. For example, restaurant, hotels. So these are the move up, moving up the chains. So and of uh, of a recent uh, explanation, they further develop it into the uh, quaternary, like trade and commerce, in the form of transportation, communication, uh, finance, and so on. And the topmost uh, layer of this uh, Clark uh, Fisher triangle is the uh, queenery, which is extended human potential in the form of, for example, education, research. So this is claimed as the highest level of service in the form of making up the economic activity, right? For all this to work, right, for all this to function, if you want to be the productivity to be high, so you have to have the output to be high and the input, you got to lower it down so that in such a way, productivity can be maximized, right? Because productivity equals to output over input. So these are the relation between the primary uh, towards the tertiary and also quinary uh, uh, layer of the economic activity as far as service is concerned. Okay, uh, this graph is also available in your uh, textbook and also in your PowerPoint slides. So if you take a look on the form of a year uh, in terms of a timeline uh, from year uh, 1800 to 1900 and later latest a new millennium, year 2000 and plus. So, and if you take a look on the percentage in terms of uh, employment, right? So in the olden, uh, in the olden uh, years, basically, of course, people are focusing more on agriculture because they, want, they need to produce foods. And later that foods are becoming abundant, becoming many. So they need to preserve the food so that they need to process it. They need to uh, preserve it in, in the form of packaging or uh, canning and so on. So this is where goods uh, will uh, be processed into the other uh, form so that it can sustain for a long time. And on top, uh, on top of that, uh, later they move on to the uh, segment for services in which value form enhancing the capability of interaction among people. So the goods that is packaged or being canned, they can be served or export to uh, many parts of the world uh, to be available for global market, right? So these are what the trends in of employment by sector in the United States. So they are all uh, moving up uh, the uh, employment towards the servicing sector. Okay, if you remember, if you relate this economic development with the uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs, these are my uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs. I think you have learned this in your psychology course in your year two or year one. You took this course. So basically, for human to be living, uh, they need to fulfill their uh, physiological needs. For example, they need uh, resting, they need uh, foods and drink. 
after uh, they have this layer, they need to be feeling safe. For example, they need to uh, have homes as a protection from uh, the uh, rain and sun or environment, right? So, and after that, they need the uh, friends or family, uh, love and belongings. And after that, humans try to uh, achieve what they wish they want to achieve. For example, uh, success in education and after that they actualize their dreams for example becoming what they want to become for example uh, to be a successful entrepreneur or to be a rich man or to be success uh, sex, uh, successful engineer and so on so these are self-actualization so this is comparable also with the also economic development uh, basically it is uh, now, uh, it starts here, which is a pre-industrial revolution. We, we could call it IR uh, 1.0. And later, when the agricultural activity has become abundant, so there are many outputs. So they need to somehow to process it so that they can keep the lifetime longer, so that they can also export or they can sell it uh, to a further distance. And then we move on to the post-industrial society in which uh, people are focusing more on, for example, automation and later moving on to Industrial Revolution 4.0, which is later focusing much on this information value or IT, right? Okay, here is uh, presented the stages of economic development, right? So if we take a look on this matrix, right, basically we start here from the pre-industrial revolution or pre-industrial society in which during those times people are basically cultivating uh, uh, crops right in which uh, they use a lot of uh, human labor raw which is hands uh, a lot of muscle they uh, need to use and assisted by the animals and they use uh, simple uh, hand tools However, as we are moving on to industrial revolution in the year 1800s, so more machines are being incorporated into their goods production. For example, a uh, machine for milling is created. So basically, uh, the technology uh, has become more mechanized. Uh, I would say more machines are generating the, uh, uh, the uh, power. So instead of uh, using muscle power by human, so these are during in which the industrial revolution is all about. And after that, we are moving into a post-industrial society in which people are moving more oriented towards information because the information creates the value. Okay, So in which when information has become uh, the norms of the society, so it will uh, more... Uh, uh, it will more serve toward service economy in which it is uh, more on community oriented uh, we become interdependent and as such we are becoming interdependent we are relying on the technology that is based on information for example the internet uh, IT system network computer uh, intranet and so on so these are basically the development of the economic stages from muscle base and then to machine base and later information based. Okay. Well, nowadays uh, you have heard uh, a lot on industrial uh, revolution. So these are the name of the era in which we are living uh, right now, uh, which is based on uh, information. So basically, industrial revolution consists of the four main domains for example the first one is big data analytic in which uh, huge data being generated every day for example in instagram facebook twitter tiktok you name it those are basically data you generate every day so this data is basically can be data mine or can be used uh, to make projection for marketing uh, analyze the trend and so on so the second part of industrial revolution, revolution is artificial intelligence. Basically, uh, the bottom line of AI is basically we want to make machines, our current machine, becoming smarter so that they can also assist humans to make decisions like in the form of, for example, autonomous uh, driving. So those are 
uh, basically part of AI. So the third component of Internet uh, of IR 4.0 is uh, Internet of Things, IoT, in which our life is becoming more embedded with Internet. For example, smartphones, servers, and last but not least, IR 4.0 component is, uh, the last one is robotics in the form of uh, robot arms in assembly line like automobile or by incorporating drones to make our job much faster and easier. So those are part what we call robotics. Uh, let's take a look uh, quickly uh, a video clip uh, that explain about how does industrial revolution influence our work and life uh, in this short video clip. A vision of tomorrow's manufacturing. Products finding their way independently through the production process. In intelligent factories, machines and products communicate with each other, cooperatively driving production. Raw materials and machines are interconnected within an Internet of Things. The objective, highly flexible, individualized and resource-friendly mass production. That is the vision for the fourth industrial revolution. A look back at history. At the end of the 18th century, the first steam engines and the intelligent use of hydropower revolutionized production. The late 19th century so saw the rise of electrical engineering and mass production. The first moving belt conveyor was used as long ago as 1870 in the slaughterhouses of Cincinnati, Ohio. In the mid-1970s, electronics and IT began to expand rapidly into industry. Siemens developed the first Simatic. Production became increasingly based on computer-assisted controls. The fourth industrial revolution is still a vision. Experts believe that it will only become a reality within the next 20 years. In intelligent factories, everything is interconnected wirelessly. At the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence in Kaiserslautern, this future can already be experienced right now. Research is underway here into exactly what the industrial production of tomorrow will be like. Fabriken werden zukünftig aus Bausteinen bestehen, aus smarten oder intelligenten Bausteinen, wie man es nennen mag. Vergleichen wir das vielleicht mal so ein bisschen mit einer Lego-Steinwelt. Das heißt, wir haben standardisierte Bausteine, die wir hoffentlich relativ einfach zusammenstecken und zusammensetzen können. Jeder dieser Bausteine hat bestimmte Funktionalitäten und wir können sie zukünftig in einem solchen fabrikinternen Internet dann kombinieren. A bottling plant for liquids set up together with Siemens is used to demonstrate the most important components of the intelligent factory of the future. Each bottle contains an RFID chip storing a precise description of how it has to be processed. Well, I think uh, I don't uh, intend to show the whole video clip, uh, so I just show part of it. Uh, later, I will upload uh, into the Edmodo flat, uh, platform on the um, uh, video clip at this course, so you can have a full look on the video uh, clip, what it's all about, on full uh, video clip of Industrial Revolution 4.0. Okay, so continuing my lecture is basically if we take a look on US employment as far as uh, for like uh, 10 years ago, this is uh, 2009, okay, you can see that the three uh, major or most contributor for uh, jobs or employment in the US are basically from one, which is here, 19% transportation and utility, utility which is, uh, I would say, distribution, uh, logistic uh, services, uh, shipping, Right, so that those are basically 19% uh, of a US job. So second highest is basically retailing and uh, wholesale. This is basically, I would uh, say, uh, selling, uh, retailing, like supermarkets, uh, like uh, uh, shopping marts, uh, shops. So these are uh, taking about 14% of the employment in the US, okay? And the third biggest is basically 13% uh, related to, I would say, government services or municipal municipalities uh, based jobs. So those are basically services uh, that is contributing 13% of the job in the US back 10 years ago. And I believe nowadays in 2020, this one has grown quite significantly bigger. 
Okay, if you if you take a look uh, on the projected of uh, U.S. job uh, growth from 2008 to 2018 to most recently, and we can sum up that uh, professional and uh, related uh, job are basically contributing the most. Secondly, in the service sector, for example, logistic, banking, airlines. So these are the two biggest contributor of uh, projected uh, job growth in the United States. Okay, let's take a look on the economic evolution. How economy is being evolutionized. For example, uh, well, we have here on the uh, timeline uh, growth, which is from agrarian to industrial and then to service. And later, the service will be moving towards experience-based economy. Okay, so if you take a look on the economic offering in the agrarian time and during the agriculture age, we focus basically producing foods. However, if food become abundant, so they need to be preserved. Uh, so that's why the factory is coming in uh, as far as packaging them by doing that preservation like uh, frozen or canning or uh, uh, vacuum packaging so the food will uh, last longer. When the goods have uh, been able to be made lasting longer, so we need a service in order to sell or distribute the packaged goods. That is why exporting uh, to other countries or uh, delivering uh, to the other part of the uh, nation is important. And then after you have the commodity service, and then economy will be moving towards uh, experience, which is based on consumer services. So food become abundant, commodity become uh, service, uh, commodity has been uh, the name of the game. So people will uh, focus more on getting better experience to get food. For example, ordering the food from a food delivery service like uh, Food Panda or uh, Grab Food and so on. So this is on consumer service side. On experience-based uh, economy, uh, the other part is business services. So you could acquire your business to business service from Alibaba, for example, right? So, well, you could see some other function uh, in which uh, from the uh, uh, agrarian moving to a service nowadays and later very much uh, being uh, moving towards a better or good experience by customer. Okay, so next. For example, buying for experience. Okay, have you... Uh, ever experience uh, playing or uh, take a ride on a roller coaster? So, some people got scared uh, with taking a roller coaster, but some people say they are having fun. So, basically, if you take a roller coaster, you are paying to get the experience, right? Be it fun or be it scared. So, basically, you are paying for that. Let's have a look on this uh, short video clip how is people are buying for experience. Here comes the OMFG moment. Holy crap! Oh, OMFG! Holy crap! Oh, ho, ho. Oh, ho, ho. Holy crap, here we go! Oh, ho, ho. oh I gotta pee now! Seriously, one of the most intense wooden roller coasters on the freaking planet. Whew! El Toro at Six Flags Great Adventure kicks ass all over the place. We are hot. This is a Six Flags.
Okay, I think uh, I don't intend to show uh, all the video clip. So this is to explain to you. Nowadays, economy is moving towards a service and later towards based on experience. So people are willing to pay a uh, big amount of money to get the experience. So this is what it's all about. Okay. So now we are discussing the four metrics or the four quadrants of realms of experience. I would say dimension of experience. So if you take a look on this uh, four quadrant, on the metrics, uh, on the Y uh, metrics, you have the passive type of customer participation or the active type of customer participation. This is passive or active. Where else on the X axis, you have the environmental relationship. How is related uh, of you, the customer, towards the environment? Is it absorption or immersion? So let's take a look on the first quadrant. They call it like uh, uh, this quadrant they call for entertainment quadrant. In entertainment, for example, if you are going uh, move, uh, watching a movie in the theater, right? So you are, your customer part participation is basically passive. You just sit there and looking at the screen or perhaps just enjoying your snacks and drinks. That's all the most you can do. And in terms of environmental relationship, yeah, basically you are being absorbed into watching or following the uh, storyline or following the movies. So this is Q1, quadrant one. For quadrant two, we will take a look on the, uh, like for example, in this segment, for example, education. Perhaps you are learning new language, like learning Japanese or learning uh, English. So customer participation in this quadrant two, basically they are active because they really need to participate actively because they are learning new language. They need to say new words. They, they need to memorize new uh, vocabularies and so on. On the environmental uh, relationship, so customer relation to the environment, basically they need to absorb because they need really to follow the uh, the uh, environment of new language, for example, memorizing the words, uh, learning about the grammar, so the, uh, that is the uh, absorption for learning new language. This is uh, quadrant three, more on aesthetic, in which customer participation is passive, yet the environmental relationships, uh, you need to have some sort of immersion. For example, you join a tour, you join uh, join a tour, uh, for example, a tour guide. Uh, you go uh, to uh, interesting places in which your participation is quite passive. You just see and listen. However, you need to be immersed into the situation so that you can follow what is being uh, explained uh, by the tour guide. So that is Q3 uh, in the form of a quadrant named aesthetic. And last but not least, in the quadrant 4, <coughs> which is uh, escape, all right? So you need to have active customer participation and the environmental relationship is you need to immerse it. So this is the highest Q4 on the realms of experience, right? The reality of experience, which is at Q4, for example, like scuba diving, you really need to uh, join the scuba diving team go under the ocean and see the corals, for example. So that is what they call uh, active participation and yet you need to fully immerse towards the surrounding and the environment like in scuba diving. So there, there are a few or many principles of uh, design to have a good experience for customer, right? So the, the design principle for getting highest value experience, they call it, for example, team uh, the experience. For example, you can design the environment or the ambience uh, of the setting so that the customer can feel good uh, to it, right? So, for example, like a forum shop, 
right? Uh, digital principle or harmonizing impression with positive clues, like in airport, right? Some of the airport they design it nicely so that it can give a good impression of the country. Like uh, another design principle is eliminate negative cues uh, and uh, mix in memorabilia, right? For, for example, hard rock T-shirt. So it's for memory, engage all five senses. For example, you go in into a rainforest, but it is actually a man-made rainforest. So these are few design principles that we could emulate on. Let's take a look on uh, one example. This is a team the experience. Okay, have any have any one of you uh, draw by or going to Bangi Kopitiam? Right, Bangi Kopitiam uh, available uh, in many uh, big cities. Right, not only in Bangi, so it is uh, there in KL many places. So it, uh, the design principle is team the experience. Basically, you need to set the setting so that it give you uh, some sort of uh, retro environment. Because if you go to Bangi Tiam outlet shop, uh, coffee shop, uh, they use the old chair, uh, old. Uh, cups, old dishes, so that it looks like in uh, like just like old Kopitiam in 1970s, for example. So this is because Bangi Kopitiam is being designed based on theme for uh, theme the experience. Okay, so I think uh, it is about uh, 25 minutes now. So I'm uh, stopping here uh, first. Uh, I stop at typology of services as part one and uh, subsequently I will issue a part two to continue until uh, finishing the chapter. Okay, uh, we take uh, uh, we take uh, we take a break uh, for a while for the uh, from this session.